with me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter number 2. Genesis, chapter number 2. Verse number 7. And then if you would turn to uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 21. We'll start reading that. Genesis 2, 7. In 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Amen. I pray that this will be a blessing to you and we will be a challenge to you as well. I love when the Word of God challenges us. Praise God. Genesis 2 7. The Bible says, And God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, speaking of spiritual death, <coughs> I want you to think for a moment what spiritual death is this morning. That is separation from God. Wow. That is huge. You talk about separation from people, we've never experienced that. What we know is the life in which God birthed us and we are given to people. Some of us have, I would say most of us, have some very close people to us. So death becomes a painful thing when those folks that are close to us are, are gone. But can you imagine that spiritual death when you are separated from God? That is spiritual death this morning. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. I want us to think this morning of a few things, and I pray that the Lord will help us challenge your heart and your mind. But one, one of the ideas of the soul, uh, when we think about the soul, it fascinates men. Think about what the soul does. It, it's the religious conviction. Uh, uh, think of the origin of the soul. Think of uh, all the debates that have been because of the origin of the soul. That emotional part of us, the will. Uh, that Where did that come from? Where is that birth from? Uh, where does it come? There's been many debates. and Most of all, I believe that when we look at it from a humanistic side, the debates become cloudier and muddier as the water is churned up by the debates of where the soul came from. But I believe the quandary, the wonder of it all can be answered when we look at the pages of the Word of God. There can be definitive answers that are given to where did the soul come from. And uh, uh, not only a glimpse, but I believe that, that we can uh, gain uh, infinite knowledge uh, that will give us clarity to the soul. Did anybody ever go by a rippling brook before and you look and you see your reflection in that brook and, and, and the ripple of it, maybe it'll twist your face and it'll belong in your face. Maybe it'll give you wrinkles that you never knew that you had. And you look a little bit farther and you realize that it's you. And as you look at it, maybe there's even some questions about what do I look like? Uh, uh, as you look at the rippling of yourself. Well, I believe the Word of God, when we look at the soul, takes away the ripples, takes away the belongness, uh, takes away the uh, uh, cloudiness of it, and it gives us some definitive answers to, to the soul. And uh, we look and we find that, that Moses gives us an account of creation. He gives us the trees and the herb and, and, and the food that is for man. Uh, he gives us some ideas into the color of the world. He gives us all these species of the fish and uh, even some mammals that live in the water. And he tells us everything. 
anything about that that lives in the ocean. He tells us about the birds that fly in the air. And even birds that, that never will go into flight. God, Moses gives us information into that. Amen. All sorts of land animals and, and that of the reptiles and the insect. And then Moses tells us some details about man. That very first man. That man named Adam. And so God created uh, the one and only man. And his name was Adam. And uh, to, to find out more details of the soul, Sister Dot, we have to begin to read more of what Moses gave us in, in that book of beginnings, in the Pentateuch, and, and in that book of Genesis. When God created the world by His spoken power, He, he spoke into existence everything round about us. But can I say it this way, Brother Eli, when God created man, he got dirty. He got dirty, Sister Tina. He got down in the dust of the earth. And he began to form man. But I want you to think about a few things, and I'm not going to get greatly scientific, but I want you to think for a few minutes as I lay a basis. God began to create organs. And God created a circulatory system. And God created a respiratory system. And God created... Uh, 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 a digestive system. He ingeniously fashioned everything about man. And then he created, Terry, this skeletal system that would support man. I mean, it's crazy, amazing. When you think about our bodies and how God created it. Then he takes and he creates not only the skeleton system, but he puts the muscles in there. And then he creates joints. The parts move. I mean, it's crazy. Maybe some of your parts don't move as good as they used to, but they still move, right? I mean, they move, and, and God did all this. And, and, and then it, he, he takes it, and, and behind this torso, he puts the spine that, that bends and flexes, that it's able to lift. And then he creates this body that when I look at you, he even created you in such a way that you can smile. I love that. I love that when I'm, I'm, I, 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 I come across someone and, and they smile because God created that ability to smile. And then he puts a little twinkle in an eye and then he gets, a cre he gets so creative that he helps us be able to blink. Not all that there are many scientific reasons behind that. I, I, I'm not going there and I couldn't go there even if I wanted to. And then he takes all these systems and he correlates them with this one system called a nervous system. And this whole nervous system correlates with the whole body and all the other systems. And he puts them together. I mean, how amazing is that that God would do that for you and I? But here it is that that with all this creative genius that God does and uh, everything that he invested into him, still man lay there in the dust and, and, and he didn't do anything. He just lay there. There was no life for the Walt. And to all of a sudden that God not only gets dirty, but he breathes who he is in the main time. And he breathes the breath of life into Adam. Amen. And there's, there was no personality. There was no self. There was no desire. There was no delight. There was no passion. There was no personhood. There was no hunger. There was no, no, no blood flowing through his veins. Amen. Now Adam had need of something. He needed a soul. So God breathed in. How awesome, how fearfully and wonderfully are you and I made this morning that God got dirty making us, but God breathed into us and he gave us a soul. Amen. Uh, not only did he just breathe into Adam, but Adam became a living soul. Amen. Uh, he had a spirit. He had a soul. Amen. He was a living soul. Amen. Life's breath, when it leaves the body, amen, the soul leaves the body as well. Amen. You see the body. There it is in its fullness. But when it dies, uh, the soul, the spirit of God, amen. And I want to talk about the need to take care of that spirit and soul this morning. Yes, I know it's important to take care of the body. We spend lots of time doing that. We brush our teeth in the morning. We comb our hair. We bathe our body. We feed our body. We water our body. 
body. We give it nutrients. We buy the latest fashions for our body. We live in houses that, 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 that keep the temperatures regulated because we want to take care of our body. We go on vacations because we are resting our bodies. We exercise because we are strengthening our bodies. But what about our soul this morning? Amen. It is as real and vital as the flesh. Amen. And the soul is what gives the person, amen, their personality, their feelings, their desires, their affections, their appetites, their emotions, their passion, their will. Amen. It's all the essence of the soul. And it's necessary that we take care of it. Amen. Amen. We've got to take care of it. Adam's soul was issued out of the breath of God. He gave it. But I mean, he can take it away. I'm not going to get into a theological debate this morning. A lot of different people died yeah. for ages. Huh? But God is in charge of life. He's in charge of the body. He's in charge of the soul. I like what Ezekiel 18 4 says. It says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of your father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God is in charge of the soul. God was the father of Adam's soul. And when Adam had his first son, God breathed into him life too. And each of their sons and their daughters, they met every one of them. God has never relinquished sovereign control over the soul. God is the giver and the keeper, and he will be the taker of the soul. Bottom line. You can argue as much as you want. You can know medicine. You can know science. You can take care of yourself. But God is the one who is a speaker of life to the soul. You can think it can be shortened. And you can think that someone's is longer. But God is in sovereign control of the soul that is kept in a body. For whatever time on it, it's there. And so, Scripture speaks of the soul in many ways. It talks about the hungry soul. And it talks about the weary soul. It talks about the thirsty soul. The grieving soul. It talks about the loving soul. And the Word of God says that he who converts a sinner from his error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sin. Receive the Word of, with meekness. Uh, the, the grafted word, which is able to save your soul. Peter wrote, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So when Adam entered the conscience, amen, uh, he was coming out of the void of nothing, and he sprang forth from death. The beauty of his life emerged from paradise. He became a living soul. Amen. Living denotes that it had substance. God gave substance to Adam. He gave him a soul. And I need to tell you that God has given each and every one of us in your soul. Amen. And, and we live together in community with family members and descendants. We all benefit from this one thing. It's called a soul. And we've got to take care of our soul. I believe that's why you're here this morning. Amen. We've got to take care of our soul. We inherit a lot of things. We inherit a lot of things from our parents. Any of you ever look in the mirror and realize that you are your parents? <laughs> no, you know, I look at some of you and you, you look like your parents. Sorry to tell you that. You look at your children and they look like you. And you know, you ever notice good or bad your children or your parents? You have their habits and your children have your habits. I mean, it's part of the, the, the gene pool. We call it DNA, but I'm just going to use the word gene to be simple this morning because DNA is so complex, and we're learning more and more about that. We're learning how that we can take things out of DNA to give a better life to the next generation. I mean, DNA is so amazing. And so when we look at this, uh, 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 everything that is in, in the human race has been given by Adam. Everything. So God passes down through Adam everything that you and I have. Isn't it amazing? Do you ever look at an acorn? How many ever played with acorns before? Don't eat them. I heard they're not good to eat. 
My mom always tells me that we wanted to eat acorns when we were little kids. And she hoped we'd never get it. You know, crazy ideas. I say that. How many ever looked at the acorn? And when you look at that acorn, do you know that was inside of there? Now I know this ain't this ain't, this this isn't rocket science, but stop and think for a minute. That inside of that acorn is the potential to be this huge, crazy, big tree. I mean, crazy big. Crazy big. And inside of that acorn, there is a certain type of bark. And there is a certain type of leaf. And there's a certain type of, uh, of grain that will be in that. Everything about that tree, the potential is in that acorn. I, I mean, think about it. Amen. I, 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 God allowed that in Adam, amen, he would take one life and desire would be passed on. There would be wills that would be passed on. There would be emotions that would be passed on. There would be breath that would be passed on. There would be one blood type, amen. There would be a nation that would be passed on. There would be cultures. And at the same time, they're all from one. You look at it and, 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 and realize this morning, every one of us in here came from the same person, and that is Adam. Every one of us in here, you look at uh, uh, the, the, the culture that's sweeping our, our country, that, that certain lives matter. Yes, every life matters because we all came from the very same start. It's crazy. But it all came. As splendid as it is, every bit of our genes, our hereditary was passed down. Every bit of information that is in our DNA has been passed down from Adam. It's passed down from our moms and our dads. Our human traits, our talents, our gifts, our abilities, uh, the distinguished uh, uh, qualities that, that make our genetic makeup, it's all passed down. And it's all from Adam. Every talent, every gift, every craft, every endowment, every expertise, every intelligence, every ability, every mental to power. Amen. And I need to tell you that all this came because it was made in God's own image. How crazy. Every one of you have gifts and every one of you have talents. Every one of you have things and they're diverse and they're different from each, each one of us. But it all was passed down from that. Amen. Crazy to think about. All humanity has been derived from but there's also one of the traits from the past year. And that is sin and a soul that is separated from God. When Adam and Eve chose to rebel against what God had commanded them to do in the garden of Eden, sin separated them. Now I know this is pretty elementary in some ways, but hold on. We're going to get somewhere. I want us to think about folks that throughout history have had some great things to pass on. Do you ever think of Plato? Who is Plato? He is that teacher of Aristotle. He was the disciple of Socrates. And he has philosophies that we even use today. Uh, his impact upon philosophy and political theory is still being studied and analyzed today. He was able to analyze, he was able to uh, explain problems and values and the disciplines of logic. But I need to tell you, as brilliant as he is in his brilliance, he could not save his own soul. He inherited a lot of good things. He inherited some good things, Brother Josh, from some genes that was passed down to him. But he was not able to inherit Sister God, an intelligence that would be able to save his soul. Think about Michelangelo. He was an artist and he was a sculptor and, 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 and he was an architect. He had one of the greatest influences on all the world that we know of as art. Think about the Sistine Chapel in which it was two to 12,000 square feet and it took him four years to paint the beauty upon that. I think about how that he painted the Lord's Supper and he sculpted sculptures of David and of Moses, but yet in all of his talents and all of his accomplishments, as much as it still entertains people today, he still did not have the ability to entertain God in his very soul. He inherited a lot of things in his DNA, but he did not inherit an ability to entertain God who wanted a relationship with his soul. Interesting. I look at 
William Shakespeare, think of that Macbeth. I remember that. That, that, that was probably one of the, uh, the, the greatest, uh, for, for me, one of his pieces that he wrote. I studied in high school. Still remember that as complex and as crazy as it seemed. Think about Romeo and Juliet. I think about how that he, he made uh, an impact on, on history because of, uh, of his uh, being able to be a, a, a drama, uh, a drama uh, enticer, if you would, uh, a poet, but in all of his dramatic. I'm talking about DNA that's been inherited. I'm talking about talents and ability. But yet, we still inherit the problem that the soul will die separated from God because we inherited it from our father Adam. Think about a man named Ludwig. They told him. I mean, he wrote masterpieces that they still play on the piano and on the violin. In his time, he was such an influential and a respected composer. But musically, amen, he could not even in music as wonderful as it is. Think about it. It does affect you. Uh, my wife sings this little song to our girls at night all night and all day. Angels watching over you. Yesterday, I, I'm one of my wife was at work. I was taking care of the girls. And they were rocking their babies. And Tina taking care of them. I looked over and little Brenda, she was singing all night, all day. She was singing it. She didn't know all the words, but she was singing it to her babies because music impacted her. You think about it. You hear a rhythm, and you won't be able to get it out of your head. It'll be stuck there. And you hear a song, and all of a sudden, maybe a song from years ago, but you can uh, begin to, to, to sing the tune of it and the words. Uh, and you think about it. But Beethoven and all this musical ability could not develop a relationship with him and God. Albert Einstein, think about him, that theoretical physics uh, who, who, who even today we use as tech, uh, his, his research in modern technology, particularly when it comes to, uh, to radiology. Uh, he gave us uh, great things. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1921. But in all this theology and all this rhetoric and all this study, he could not breach the relationship that was between the soul and God. Sports stars will come and go. Every NFL player, every Olympic player, every NBA player, every boxing champion and basketball champion that ever will be in their sprint speed and their strength and their coordination, there must have been something they inherited from their parent. But in all their speed and strength, they cannot reconcile the relationship between their soul and God. We think about Bill Gates, we think about Warren Buffett, we think about Jim Walton and all the Michael Bloomberg's that are the billions of dollars. And if we can bind them together, they still could not buy the right relationship between the soul and God. So that everything, Sister Bev, that's been inherited, there's a problem. The sin nature that is inherited does not have a solution. So the Bible says God sent it for the second Adam. <laughs> the second Adam. The second Adam. The Bible says that, that Adam was made a living soul, but the second Adam, he was made by the Craig something different. It was called a quickening soul. It means that he would be able to bring a lot. And, and the destiny that the first Adam brought and all the DNA that's been passed down to every one of us could not bring to us what the second Adam brought in that he gave his life for us. Amen. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, Master, he said, I know that you are, you, 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 you are of God. Can you tell me what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus spoke to him. He said, except the man be born again of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I need to tell you that as good as you are, we are waging a war like never before in our culture that folks believe that they are good, that they have the DNA, that they have the stuff, that they will make it to heaven. You can be smart, you can be rich, you can be talented, you can be crafted, you can be gifted, but you will still die and go to hell because there's nothing you can do to 
save your own soul. the Savior. So God sent the second Adam. So Jesus Christ, in obedience to God's will, He became self-sacrifice to reverse the condemnation that was given by the first Adam. Peter said, you must repent. You must repent the necessary thing for salvation. Hey, listen, I need to deliver my soul this morning. You can come to America for about church time and time again. But unless you repent and turn from sin, you will die and go to hell. That's a hard message to preach. That's a hard message to preach. But we're all one in Adam. We shared his disobedience. We inherited the curse that Adam had. But spiritually, the second Adam came to break the curse. But it takes a repentance and a turning from sin that will break the curse of sin and death. And will give a life and will give a life to the soul. Revelation 26 says of the second death, it will have no power over those who are in the second Adam, Jesus Christ. Those are my terminology. To bring it all to you. I need to ask you this morning, how well are you caring for your soul? Sister Holly, if you'll come to the piano this morning. We are drilled in our culture to take care of ourselves. We're drilled with health screenings from billboards that are advertised to our insurance company sending us mail flyers and emails and text messages. Amen. Take care of yourself. Be proactive. We are drilled in our culture that we need to rest. We are drilled in our culture to eat properly, to have proper nutrition. We are drilled in our culture uh, that we need to do everything that we can to have healthy, uh, a healthy life, healthy relationships. Amen. Take vacations and rest. Make sure that you're taking your vitamins. Even in our culture, we have such a balanced diet that we don't even have to have vitamins the way that they did 75 years ago because we eat more balanced. In our culture, we know all about uh, finding a place of rest and relaxation. We know all about going to bed at a certain time and getting up at a certain time. We have more things to benefit our health than any time that man has ever lived. But my concern is not about our body. But my concern is about what about what we lost in Adam? What about our soul? What about the relationship with our soul and God? that we need to be careful. We need to make sure that we're uncovering hidden sins. Things that are sins between us and God. Two things that I'm concerned about. Number one, we become so culture oriented that the morality of our life is lived by culture and not by the standard of God's work. God, help us to know your word and what truth is so that our soul can be right with you. Sometimes things come in unaware and we have to look at our soul. We have to say, I'm digging up this bitterness because a low root can spread and defile many. I have to dig up this envy. I have to dig up this jealousy. I look at, and you probably heard this term before, but there's some folks who live in toxic relationships. I gotta tell you, I'm thankful for my home and for my wife. So 
Sometimes it can be chaotic, but not because we're arguing and bickering and fighting. Not because there's sin that's running rampant in our home. But some, some relationships are just poisonous. Some folks live in this world.